Welcome to the online service for Oak Park Church of Christ for January 24th. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. We're really excited to have a message brought to us by Dr. Ron Fraser on uh, the book of Acts chapter 8 this morning, continuing on in our sermon series, The Church in a Hot Mess. Would you join me this morning in a call to worship by reading responsively every second verse? Our call to worship this morning comes from Proverbs chapter 4. Listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. For I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. Get wisdom, get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. The beginning of wisdom is this, get wisdom. Though it costs all you have, get understanding. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown.
Good morning. I'm sure we've all purchased something only to discover that it's not what we actually thought it was. Uh, the homemade pumpkin pie I once purchased at a farmer's market uh, for Thanksgiving uh, dinner looked absolutely amazing. Uh, a deep dish apple pie, pumpkin pie. Uh, who could refuse it? But uh, one bite told the story. The cook had substituted salt for sugar. I had a very good friend once who traveled to Rome and on a train platform encountered a man selling Rolex watches. He had them on display inside his trench coat, uh, quite a selection. My friend always wanted a Rolex and the man's inventory seemed quite reasonably priced, a fraction of the normal price. Uh, he told my friend they're all factory overruns. Uh, so he gave the man $200 for one and you probably already know the rest of the story. He got the watch home uh, and it didn't work. So he took it to a jeweler and uh, to have it fixed, but there were no insides in it. It was a Rolex in appearance, but the heart of its operation was missing, an empty shelled Rolex. I'll come back to that uh, in today's message, but today I want to uh, we want to look at Acts 8, 4 to 25 uh, in the series on uh, the book of Acts called The Church in a Hot Mess. And uh, in this story, it's the first of two stories about Philip, one of the seven uh, deacons. And this one is about the beginnings of the Samaritan uh, mission. Let me read the passage. Those who had been scattered, uh, this is from the persecution of Stephen, or after Stephen, preached the word wherever they went. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs that he did, they all paid attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. And so there was great joy in that city. Now for some time a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is the divine power known as the great power. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. And Simon himself was uh, believed and was baptized. And he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. When the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. And when they arrived, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon any of them. They had simply been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me this ability so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. And Peter answered, May your money perish with you because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part or share in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord. Perhaps he will forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and a captive to sin. And then Simon answered, Pray to the Lord for me, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. And when they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, 
Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. Now, reading the book of Acts is a little bit uh, like hiking in the mountains. It's only one trail, but at every turn, uh, there's a new vista. There's a new scene that opens up before us. Every corner you walk around is a new surprise, a new panorama of beauty. Uh, and the book of Acts is much like this, the story of the early church. Each chapter brings a new scene, new colors, new textures, fascinating people. And even within each chapter are picture we've, pictures we've never seen before. Now, Luke is good at um, drawing pictures for us. He's all kinds of things. He's a medical doctor, a Gentile, the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. He's a world traveler, and he's an apologist, a defender of the faith, making the case for why the kingdom of God is not necessarily a threat to Caesar and the Roman Empire. And he does this with his amazing pictures of how the gospel raises up disciples, Jesus lovers, not soldiers or Caesar haters. The kingdom of heaven, the rule of love, is breaking in through Jesus lovers. Everywhere the good news goes, people are embraced, the broken are healed, the chains of bondage are broken, people are free to love one another, and joy breaks out. This is a new story, a story the world had never heard before, and it's full of surprises. Surprises at every turn in the journey. This is why Ivan Illich, a man who, like Luke, is a historian and apologist, says that the defining trope of Christian history is surprise. This morning text, uh, text relishes surprises. And I picked up on five of them. There are others uh, that uh, one could find. But I want to focus on five this morning. Surprise number one is this. God's mission has a church. Did you get that? God's mission has a church. What is God's mission? It's in our text, verse 12. They believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God. The mission of God is to establish his rule, the restoration of all things to their created design and purpose. Jesus had said, I must preach the good news of the kingdom. This is why I was sent. And again, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, the recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of restoration. Everything in our faith is about the rule of God, about the healing of brokenness, the ministry and miracles of Jesus, his death and resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of God, and his pouring out of his spirit on those who love him, that they too might be instruments and in signs of the kingdom, is all about God's mission. And surprise, surprise, here is his church doing the same thing. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. God wants to restore all things. Jesus came to begin the process, and here the church picks up where he left off, restoring what is broken. God's mission has a church. Surprise two, God's mission has a church of ordinary Jesus lovers. From the early part of the story, we might be led to believe that those who tell the good news were only apostles they, after all, were witnesses of Jesus' resurrection and were most intimate with uh, his ministry. These are the men who declared, we won't wait on tables because we need to give ourselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. But the first outbreak of the gospel from Judaism is brought not by an apostle, 
but by a Hellenistic Jew named Philip. From waiting on tables in Jerusalem to running for his life from persecution, he arrives in Samaria, the text says, proclaiming the Christ and demonstrating his power to restore people spiritually and physically. If God's mission can be embraced by people of questionable pedigree, the Samaritans, it can be shared by people of mixed heritage, Philip. God's mission has a church of ordinary lovers of Jesus. Surprise number three. God's mission has an interracial church. The good news of God's reign of love in Jesus embraces all people. God wants healing for all, the restoration of relationships for all, the renewal of the whole earth. Exhibit A, God loves Samaritans. Now, nobody in Jerusalem at the beginning of the first century actually believed that. It shocked the Samaritan woman at the well, you'll remember, when Jesus asked her for a drink. How can you ask me for a drink? You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan. We have nothing to do with each other. But the history of hatred of Samaritans was century old. They were of mixed rates, half Jew, half Assyrian. When the northern kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians, they didn't deport all the Jews there. Rather, they settled the land with Assyrians and voila, voila, through intermarriage, there you have the Samaritans. <coughs> Excuse me. They had a different Bible. They read only the Pentateuch, the first five uh, books, refusing the prophets. And their holy place was in Mount, on Mount Gerizim, despite the fact that the Jews had destroyed this about 170 years before Jesus. The hate, was the hate was mutual, though. Towards the end of Jesus' ministry, as he heads to Jerusalem with his apostles, they pass through a Samaritan town that doesn't show them hospitality. And James and John ask Jesus, Lord, do you want us to call down a bolt of lightning and incinerate them? Jesus said, of course not. You can easily imagine people who have so much animosity and hatred for each other that they want to kill each other. What is war? God loves Samaritans, even if some of his people did not. Jesus secured the wrath of his opponents earlier by telling the story of the good Samaritan. Yes, a matey, a fellow of mixed race. He embodies goodness. Why? Because he dares to help someone in need. And the message is goodness resides outside of temple Judaism. Neighborliness, compassion, and humanity reside in a man of mixed race who sees the humanity of another. Goodness crosses the boundaries of race, religion, and class. The first fertile ground of the gospel outside of Judaism are these hated people. They respond to the message of Christ. And the text says there was great joy in that city. Racial recognition or reconciliation in spades. God's mission has an interracial church. Surprise number four. God's mission has an interracial church empowered for mission. You've probably heard the expression, God's work done in God's way will never lack for God's resources. So true. But would it happen in Samaria? Would this new center of God's mission come with God's resources? In the text, Philip preaches and heals the people believe him, they're baptized, and they rejoice in their newfound faith and their deliverance. It was a remarkable moment, but it was also a moment filled with great risk 
and uncertainty. What would happen now? Would the hatreds of the centuries be perpetuated in the church? The gospel had been welcomed by the Samaritans, but would the Samaritans be welcomed in the church in Jerusalem? Would the Samaritans participate in the mission of God? Would the Samaritan church share in God's resources and ministry gifts? Would the Samaritan church just be another sect and a second-rate one at that within a fragmented Judaism and remain that forever? Our son Kyle and his family have just been invited to, uh, or have just moved to Atlanta, Georgia to help plant a church. Atlanta Atlanta probably doesn't need another church. There are hundreds of them, but many of them are either black or white churches, or they are accidentally interracial. Our son and his family have been invited to be part of a church plant that is intentionally interracial. Its DNA is mixed race. And to signal they really mean it, the two lead pastors are a husband and wife. He's African American and she's Caucasian. Knowing Atlanta, the possibility of a racially fractured church is a live possibility. So just how will things turn out between Jews and Samaritans when God's love is received in Samaria? We don't need to wait long for the answer. The apostles from Jerusalem hear the news of Samaritan faith, baptisms and healings, and they send two of them, John and Peter, to check it out. One could see them as inspectors of of evangelism, making sure that Philip had gotten it right. But it's clear in our imagination, at least, that there's something both more powerful and more beautiful unfolding. The Samaritan believers kneel, the Jewish Christians lay their hands on them, and the Samaritans receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the very presence of God. Why did they need to do that? The text says, because the Holy Spirit had not yet come upon them. I. Howard Marshall calls this the most surprising verse in all of Luke's account. And I suspect, you, I suspect you already know the reason. Peter had promised, repent and be baptized every one of you. And you too will receive the forgiveness and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Samaritans had been baptized but had not received the Holy Spirit. Why? Why the delay? Now there are all kinds of answers to this. Sadly, answers that have divided the church. But reading the story as if for the first time, the easiest explanation is a rather simple one. Peter and John are declaring to the Samaritan lovers of Jesus, you too are one with the Jerusalem church. You too have partnership in God's mission. You too are witnesses and you too have resources of ministry, the same resources that we have. Why do I think this? For several reasons. The most fundamental, as- number one, the most fundamental aspect of the mission of God is that his children, together in fellowship, demonstrate a new way of being in the world. Unity is witness. The good news restores people to God. But importantly, it restores people to one another. Number two, laying on hands in Jewish tradition was, among other things, an act of solidarity. It was saying, we are with you. We're one with you. And you are one with us. Number three, the gift of the Spirit was, among other things, the new and common resource in a common mission. God's mission has a church empowered by the same spirit. As Ephesians 4 puts it, the church is, the church is called to put God's love on display 
by making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all, through all, and in all. As Michael Green says, as the apostles lay hands on the Samaritans, they are declaring a divine veto on schism in the infant church, a schism which could have slipped almost unnoticed into the Christian story as converts from the two sides of the Samaritan curtain found Christ without finding one another. That would have been Green goes on, a denial of who they were in Christ. And, in, and a denial of the very mission of God. God's church has a mission, and the equipment for mission is shared by all in that church, including Samaritans. The last surprise, surprise number five, is this. God's mission invites faith-filled followers to engage. God's mission invites faith-filled followers to engage, not fans. The text says, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm sure if Peter had been a pragmatist interested in expanding numbers in the infant church, he would have negotiated a celebrity endorsement contract with the popular Simon. But Peter is not interested in fans of Jesus. He's interested in faithful, loving followers. We don't know a lot about Simon the mag magician, other than what is in today's text, and a number of historical traditions that grew up around him. We know from the text that he'd lived in Samaria for some time and had acquired quite a following from the upper echelons of society to regular folk. His magic impressed them, and they followed him, it says, continually. He had what we would call today a pop cult following, so much so that they called him the great power of God. We also know that when Philip showed up with the good news of the kingdom, authenticated by healings, Simon too believed and was baptized. And we know the reason that Simon continually followed Philip. The text says, and pay close attention to this, he was astonished by the great signs and miracles that he saw. There are also traditions about Simon that help us to understand a little more, at least about church tradition, if not Simon. Be warned that while they may point to tendencies, they're not all accurate in the details. There are too many conflicting stories. Justin Martyr writes in the second century that a fellow Samaritan, a magician who claimed to be a redeemer of men came to Rome and there he was revered as a god and they erected a statue for him. Irenaeus, a little later, refers to Simon's Roman gig with one Hel Helena, a slave whose freedom he had purchased to serve him. And Hippolytus tells of a Simon who was competing for audience with Peter in Rome and in a spat with Peter, he commanded that a hole be dug, that he be put in the hole, and that a great mound of dirt be put upon him, and he would rise again in three days. Oops. Some of these stories are picked up by later writers and novelists, and they are great stories. Some of you may have read Lloyd C. Douglas's The Robe, the story of the soldier at the cross who won the lottery of Jesus' robe as he was being crucified. Douglas tells the story of 
was Simon the magician who thought he could fly. He jumped off a cliff to the cheers of spectators, and that didn't turn out all that well either. But much of the legend around Simon seems to be the result of a growing target on his back. He was for quite a long time regarded as the father of Gnosticism until it was uh, decided or discovered that Gnosticism didn't really come about until the second century. He is called the father of heresy and the Hesiarch of the Simonians. The apocryphal works called the Acts of Peter and the Epistle of the Apostles further add to the romance. In the mid-18th century, when this picture called The Fall of Simon Magnus was commissioned by the, uh, the, by the Vatican, the Roman Church's influence was in free fall, thanks to the growing influence of the European Enlightenment as well as the Protestant Reformation. It was to be the sketch for a marble mosaic in St. Peter's, but ended up being rejected. It's the picture of Simon falling. His hat is already on the ground, you can see, and the demons that are helping him levitate are abandoning him. Why? Peter is praying. Now, I'm not trying to sanitize Simon's reputation, but because all the stories can't be true, questions are invited. Is the vilification of Simon in Christian tradition due to projection? That is, is it due to attributing to others our own falsehoods? Or is Simon a kind of whipping boy that makes others feel good that they are the guarantors of orthodoxy? And is the fall of Simon Magnus, this picture, a kind of power grab to prop up the fading influence of the papacy? There's definitely something wrong with Simon's faith. But is Simon irredeemable? Of course not. And in asking Peter to pray for him, he's also asking for the dignity that is every person's birthright. Having said all this, as I say, there is clearly something amiss with Simon's faith. And we don't have to look very hard for it. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. The book of Hebrews defines faith this way. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Certain of what we do not see. The gallery of the faithful in Hebrews 11 are commended for their trust and their obedience in God's promises, even though they didn't live to see them. Many of them loved God but were despised by people. Some forsook great security to follow God to a city they would never see with their own eyes. Some forsook great privilege to express their love for God. All of them were sure of a hope beyond themselves and certain of what they did not see. So what's wrong with Simon's faith? One word describes his faith. He's astonished. Simon's faith stopped with what he could see. He was astonished with the miracles of healing and hope that unfolded before his eyes. But that's as far as it went. Instead of seeing who the miracles pointed to, he got stuck on what he could see. He was a fan of the spectacle. He was a spectator on the sidelines rather than a participant in the story. Miracles of restoration, healing, and the filling of God's presence are invitations to see God's love, his mercy, and his power breaking in, his kingdom coming, to join him in its coming. Simon, like all the Samaritan believers, was invited to thread the eye of faith to see the mercy of God behind what he was seeing unfold. But all Simon saw was an opportunity to, to advance his own power and popularity. Miracles, you see, are an invitation to relationship, 
to see the power and mercy of God at work and to trust him, to love him, to follow him, to surrender our hearts, our loyalty to him, to participate in ministries of reconciliation and restoration, which is the mission of God. Not Simon. Simon marveled. He was astonished. His heart was not right. He has no part in the mission of God. So when the apostles laid hands on the Samaritans to receive the Holy Spirit. All he saw was a sleight of hand. Give me this ability, he says, so that when I lay my hands on people, they will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And he holds out a bag of money uh, to gain that gift. His hope is clearly not in God, but in the prospect of adding to his, his repertoire of magic to increase power, fame, or profit, maybe all three. He wants to traffic in the things of God. Ever since Simon held out his bag of coin, all attempts to purchase influence without the prerequisite relationship with God are called simony. When Jesus declared it is an evil and perverse generation that seeks for a sign, He wasn't dissing miracles, the capacity of God to break into history to heal people, including long hatreds. He is not dissing the gift of mercy, rather rather the desire for spectacle that ends ends the pursuit of mercy. And when Peter hears the self-serving offer in angry, Seemingly angry, I'm I'm sure he was also disappointed. Um, Holy anger, he he erupts. Away with your money, and you along with it. Why, that's unthinkable, trying to buy God's gift. You'll never be part of what God is doing by striking bargains and offering bribes. Change your ways, and now. Ask the master to forgive you for trying to use God's gift to make money. I can see this as an old habit of trying to captivate others with your popularity and it's making you bitter and it's captivating you. Simon knows this gig is up. He knows it too well. He was just a fan. He was awestruck and he wanted to build his own fandom. And the whole thing had left him empty and bitter inside. He'd believed his own credits and it had blinded him to the falsehoods that he'd clutched. His heart was an empty Rolex. There are many lessons we could draw from the story of the Samaritan mission. But I think the most important one is in this surprise number five aspect of the story. And it's in a simple question. Am I a fan in the stands, privileged to consume only what I see, marveling at the mission of God in its unfolding? Or I am a follower, paying attention to my heart, engaged in that story to bring healing to all? Shall we pray? Father, thank you for who you are. Thank you for the gift of your spirit. It's given to all to to serve you and to honor you, to bring glory to you, to bring healing to our world. We pray, Father, you'd help us to receive it um, as the gift that it is, the gift of mercy, that we might that we might be merciful as well and not just think of ourselves. So forgive us where we have done that and lead us into your ways, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.
As we come to communion this morning, there really are all kinds of reasons to follow Jesus. But the best reason is to follow him, to become like him. Gordon MacDonald says, the moment you think of the kingdom as a place to achieve, to become valuable, to be prosperous or important, you will quickly discover that this was never what Jesus had in mind when he said, follow me. Each week as we come to a time when we remember that Jesus' way is the way of costly love, the way of the cross, of caring about others even when it costs us. In remembering him, we become more and more like him, more willing to walk in his ways. Shall we pray? Father, thank you for who you are and for who we are when we seek to love you and follow you. Thank you for these moments to remember your great love, your great sacrifice for each one of us. As we partake of the bread and the loaf, the bread, the loaf, and the cup. We ask that you would um, bless our moments together. Thank you, in Jesus' name, amen.
praise.